It's uh, so good to be here with you. Uh, thank you, Miles, for that lovely introduction. Uh, we, again, Rach and I, we love uh, Miles and Sarah and so many of the team here. You as a church are such an inspiration to us. It's like you're a year or two ahead of us, so we're keeping on looking at what God is doing here. Uh, you're one of my favorite follows on Instagram, and uh, every time I come here, it's like new life, new growth. Last time I was here, or I walked into this building, it was like full of you know, sticky floors and nightclub vibes, and now just to see it full of people worshiping Jesus is so encouraging, so inspiring. So thank you for all that you do to inspire us, and also uh, the generosity of people in this church ha- have uh, has, has had such an incredible impact on us at Gastry and for Worship Central. So to be here with you this morning is an absolute joy. Now, yesterday was an incredibly significant day for England. And I know you guys are all massive rugby fans. But it was the semi-final of the Rugby World Cup, which is being hosted in Japan, and it was England v. New Zealand. The All Blacks are one of the greatest, actually, they are the greatest sporting team of all time. They have a 90% winning record, but they came up against the English Warriors, and we beat them, and we're now in the final of the Rugby World Cup. There's a couple of pitches. I've had to work very hard to make this relevant to my talk, but I have. And obviously being away from home, this is just a moment to celebrate. These guys put their bodies on the line for the sake of glory, to win this incredible match. Rugby is this phenomenal contact sport. Does anyone anyone understand the rules of rugby? Actually, the other way, if you have no idea how rugby works, put your hand in the air. Well, do you know how hard it is to find a rugby ball in KL? But... uh, it's just this phenomenal battle, man on man, they're pummeling each other with tackles, it's incredibly courageous, they're running all the time, it has to be one of the most exhausting sports there is, and one of the things you have is a thing called the line out, where all the guys kind of line up next to each other, the tall men, and you throw the ball in the middle, and whoever catches it kind of wins possession, so I thought I might recreate a quick line out, just because I, I wanted to obviously come and bring you a message from the Bible, but also I wanted to educate you a bit in rugby, just... Uh, <laughs> You know, Japan have done unbelievably well in the Rugby World Cup. Maybe in four years' time, Malaysia could be a pioneer in the way. So I'm going to have Miles, uh, Sarah, Sam, and uh, Katie. You come on this side, down here. So you're going to line up all behind Miles, okay? And um, and then on this side, Luke, um, Stu... um, Do you want to... You you look like you've got rugby... Come on. And I, I, need, I need, is there any, are there any New Zealand people here? Anyone from New Zealand? <laughs> I won't put you through it. Apologies. Bear with me. This is just going to last one more. Uh, brilliant. Here we go. Always oh, got a Welsh rugby top on. So you need to know Wales are playing South Africa today in the other semi final. So, so what happens is you throw the ball in the middle and. You, each side's got to try and catch it and win possession. So here we go, okay? Let's get a drum roll going. I'm going for Katie, okay? Brilliant, thank you very much. So then Katie would go and score a try, and that's kind of how rugby works. Now. I was reading a book over the summer by uh, a former chief rabbi, Jonathan Sachs, on leadership. And he looks at the five um, first books of the Old Testament, the Torah. And he gleans some incredible insights around leadership. And I love his definition of leadership, that leadership is ultimately about taking responsibility. He says this, A leader is one who takes responsibility. Leadership is born when we become active rather than passive. And as we saw yesterday in the Rugby World Cup semi-final, these England players, they stepped up. They put their bodies on the line for the sake of a victory. And leadership is about stepping up saying, I'll pay the cost, I'll get involved, I'll be part of the solution, I'll do what it takes to see a vision become a reality, to make a difference to the well-being of people all around. And the truth is, that can be really challenging at times. It's much easier to sit back 
to criticize. And, you know, we all now with Google and on Wikipedia, we're experts on everything. We know, all know exactly what needs to happen for the economy or for uh, politics or, you know, our favorite sports team or exactly how, you know, the church should be run. We all know exactly what we think should happen. But how many of us are willing to say, I'm going to put my hand up and I'm going to be a part of the solution? That is much more challenging to live that way rather than just pointing out what is wrong with everything around us. My title of this talk this morning is this, If Not You, Then Who? If Not You, Then Who? You know, we all want to be a part of a church, don't we, that is full of life, that is a family that loves one another, that is seeing people come to faith, that is seeing people equipped and empowered in leadership, that is seeing the power of God at work, healing and transforming lives, that is on fire in worship, praise and thanksgiving. We all want to be a part of that church, but... Here's the deal. We each have to take responsibility to build that kind of church. If not you, then who? You can't just look to the leaders and say, you build it. No, it's us taking responsibility to be committed, to serve, to love, to worship, to give, to sacrifice, to see God build his church, his kingdom here in Malaysia as it is in heaven. You know, we all want to be a part of a nation that is seeing God at work, which is seeing a change of circumstances, the poor being uh, lifted up out of poverty, giving a hope and a chance, seeing radical transformation. We all want to see a nation changed by the power of Jesus Christ. But if not you, then who? We have to take responsibility to build it, to be part of the solution, part of the answer. And that, at times, can be challenging and difficult. Because there's something deep in us that is always quick to sort of abdicate responsibility. And we see throughout Scripture people saying no, you know, not taking responsibility, blaming others. Right at the beginning of creation, Adam and Eve. There's this amazing, uh, beautiful garden, this creation that they have to enjoy. And they can enjoy all of it, but there's one thing God says, do not eat from the tree of knowledge. They can eat from any other tree. There's millions of trees, millions of apples, fruit that they can enjoy, but there's something in them that just wants control. They don't trust God, and so they take the apple, Adam and Eve. And we see this moment in Genesis 3 where God is walking through the garden, and he says, Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you've done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. Do you see what's happening? Adam is blaming Eve. Eve is blaming the serpent and the serpent doesn't have a leg to stand on. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) They all fail to take personal responsibility. The mistake that they've made, the bad choice that they've made, it's someone else's fault. And how easy is it for us to fail to take on personal responsibility? Look at the life of Noah. Noah was a man who was righteous before God, credible favor upon him. At one point in history, God looks down and he sees the depth of depravity and evil within humanity and he's heartbroken. I think one of the most tragic verses in the whole of scripture, in Genesis 6 verse 6, it says, The Lord regretted that he'd made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. And so he he decides to eradicate humanity and start again. But he sees um, Noah, sorry, and he, he sees, here's a man after my own heart, a righteous man. And so he decides to save Noah and his family. And you probably know the story. You might have watched the film with Russell Crowe. Terrible film, but anyway. And two by two, the animals go onto the ark. Now, it's interesting that Noah, yes, a shining light in a dark age. But it's sad that he had no impact on the community around him. How could it be that he was one righteous man, but the lifestyle he lived didn't mean that other people around him became righteous as well, more Christ-like? That he failed in many ways to take collective responsibility for the community, the culture around him. 
the Hasidic Jews, uh, they, they talk about Moses being a righteous man in a fur coat. And by that, they mean this, that when you're cold at night, there are two ways you can get warm. One is you wear a nice fur coat. But when you wear a fur coat, you keep yourself warm. The other thing you can do is you light a fire. And when you light a fire, not only do you keep warm, but all your friends, family, people around you can also keep warm. We, as the people of God, as followers of Jesus, are always called not to wear fur coats, but to light fires. To take collective responsibility to say, I'm going to live a life full of the Holy Spirit, inspired by the life of Jesus Christ. That means people around me are changed. Because he that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. We need to take collective responsibility. Yes, Noah was an amazing man, but he failed to live a life that changed people around him. If not you, then who? I want to spend a few moments looking at the life of Moses. Again, many of you will know the story of Moses. If not, you might have watched the film Prince of Egypt. And uh, Moses was born a Hebrew, an Israelite. But he ends up being raised in Egypt, in Pharaoh's household. He experiences incredible education, incredible wealth. And as he gets older, he becomes fascinated about what is it like for an Israelite human being to live in Egypt. And the Israelites were being held as slaves, and they were working ridiculously hard to build this great empire in Egypt. And we read this in Exodus 2. It's going to come up on the screen. One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, Looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and he hid him in the sand. He sees what is happening to his fellow human beings, the people of his birth. And he's so enraged that he steps in and he acts. Now this is actually quite a difficult passage to read literally because... If anyone has been in a building site, and just walking around your city, there's building sites everywhere. So much growth and life and buildings being uh, kind of developed. But on a building site, there are always lots of people. You know, how could it be that Moses was around and there was no one else there? Actually, that couldn't have been the case because we read in a few verses later that actually a whole bunch of people saw him kill this Egyptian. One scholar suggests perhaps a clearer translation of this verse would be this. He, Moses, looked this way and that, and he saw that there was no one else willing to intervene. It wasn't that there was no one there. It was that actually no one else was willing to do anything, to stand up for this Israelite who's being killed, who's being abused. But Moses was willing to intervene. There was a story in New York a while ago of a woman who was violently attacked on a street in broad daylight and huge numbers of people walking past, but no one intervened. No one stepped in to help her. Psychologists have looked at these kind of things. They call it the bystander effect, which is this idea that we can walk past someone in need and do nothing about it. And psychologists have developed these theories. Why would we do that as human beings? There's two thoughts. One is that perhaps our brains think that if we see someone in trouble or a situation that's disturbing and no one else is getting involved, we begin to think, well, maybe it can't be that serious. Maybe I'm over-egging it. I'm getting it wrong and therefore I'm not going to get involved. But the other reason, and I think this is probably much more accurate, they call it a diffusion of responsibility, which is when we walk past and we see that someone is in need and we think, do you know what? Someone else will deal with it. Someone else more qualified, someone more confident, someone more gifted will step in and help this person who's being attacked. And what happens is hundreds of people can walk past someone in need and no one do anything. Here in this story, Moses sees someone being badly treated and he steps in and he actually makes a really bad choice. He ends up killing this Egyptian slave owner. And because of this, he ends up fleeing Egypt and he finds himself in the desert in Midian, 40 years wandering the desert as a shepherd. And we we find Moses a bit later on in the story where he's kind of jaded, a bit burnt out, uh, disillusioned, old now. And he sees this fire, this burning bush. And he's fascinated by it because in the desert, a bush would burn out very quickly, but it just keeps burning and burning and burning and burning. 
catches his eye and he's drawn to it. And he walks towards this bush and this burning bush begins to speak to him. And he begins this conversation with God, the great I am, Yahweh, where God reveals his name. And it's this incredible moment. Again, let's look at it. Exodus 3, verse 7. It says, The Lord said, I have seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. And I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land. So now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Now imagine this, Moses, an old man now, seeing this burning bush, and God begins to speak to him. God begins to say, Moses, I've heard the cry of my people. And I am going to deliver them from the most powerful nation on the face of the earth. Yes, the people of Israel have been held as captive for over 400 years. Systemic uh, violence and abuse and mistreatment. But I am going to deliver them. And Moses is going, yes, yes, I love it. I'm in. I'm all in. You know, I'm going to send someone. I'm going to raise a leader up who's going to stand in front of Pharaoh and say, let my people go. And Moses is going, come on, I'm loving this. This is awesome. And Moses, do you know who I'm going to send? Tell me, Lord, I'm going to send you. No way. No way. Brilliant for someone else to go, not me. Who am I? Who am I? How could I possibly stand up before Pharaoh? How could you use me? I'm nothing. And there's this beautiful conversation we see between God and Moses, and at one point, God says to Moses this simple, simple question Moses, what's in your hand? What's in your hand? And Moses looks and he says, It's a staff. Now, a staff represented his role as a shepherd. And again, for Egypt, a shepherd would have been the lowest of the low, they'd have been ridiculed, mocked. You know, what a waste of a career. I don't know what the equivalent would be. Maybe musicians today. (laughs) But Moses is literally standing before his God saying, what's in your hand? Not much. All I've really got is me. And I love it. God says, well, that's brilliant. I can use that. I can use that. If you give me all that you have, however small, insignificant it might feel to you, I can use that to do the most remarkable things. And Moses, you get ready. You watch me take you, and I'm going to take this staff, and this staff is going to see some of the most incredible, crazy, supernatural signs and wonders before the eyes of Pharaoh. Moments later, you see uh, Moses raising the staff before the Red Sea, and the Red Sea parts, and the people of Israel are led out of captivity into Egypt. Another time you see Moses strike a rock with this staff and water is poured out in the desert land. God takes Moses' weakness and his limitations and the little that he has and he uses it in the most miraculous way. God did it for Moses. But here's the encouraging thing. He will do it for you. And he's in the business of taking ordinary, normal people like you and me. And he's asking the question, what's in your hand? What have you got? What are your gifts there? What is your background? What are your life experiences? If you would only give them over to me, watch what I can do. Because Jesus Christ, he went ahead of us and he made a way through the power of death. He overcame the grave. He's ascended and he's resurrected and he lives victoriously. And he says the same power that raised Jesus from the grave lives in you, lives in me. So we can stand up against oppression, against an enemy, against challenge and say, my God is all powerful. He can use me. The great I am lives in me and he can take me and do the most extraordinary things if we'd only say, God, here I am. Here I am. If not you, then who? If not you, then who? I love the story of a lady called Jan. 66 years old, living in a really posh suburb in Melbourne. And uh, her mobile phone, her cell phone, two of the digits were very close 
to the phone number of a local brothel. And she, she suddenly was getting all these calls that she wasn't very comfortable with, men asking her for things that she wasn't willing to provide. And uh, she was really offended. 66 years old, she's a proper lady, you know. And, and she was mortified by it. So she thought, I'm going to change my phone number. She was about to change her phone number, and she felt God say, no, Jan, I've highlighted this to you because I want you to do something about it. In your neighborhood, there are women who are being used as sex workers in deep pain. What are you going to do about it? And she was terrified, overwhelmed, and she began to think, well, what can I do? What would I do if someone new moved into the neighborhood or if I had a friend who was in need? And she thought, I'd bake cupcakes. And so she baked cupcakes, red velvet cupcakes. And uh, she, she went to this brothel. She knocked on the door. This man opened the door, and he was a bit surprised. You know, Jan, 66, wasn't the usual clientele. And uh, he said, what do you want? And she put these cupcakes before him and said, I've baked cupcakes. Can I come in? He was obviously so shocked. He said, sure, come on in. And Jan went in. She gave these cupcakes to the women. She began conversations, and uh, she started going in weekly just to visit, to chat, to pray, to journey with these women in need. And now, fast forward eight years, all over Australia, there are these people who go and visit women in brothels, taking cupcakes, being good news, light in a darkness, because Jan said, what's in my hand? Cupcakes. <laughs> God said, I've used the staff. I can most certainly use a red velvet cupcake. <laughs> What's in your hand? If not you, then who? What has God given you that you can say, use this, if you'd only step up and take responsibility for people all around you? You know, in your workplace, God has put you there to be an influencer, to be an agent of change, to change the culture, to bring the light of Jesus Christ. You know, when you step into your place of work, the hope of all eternity walks in Jesus Christ because he lives in you. That's pretty amazing. Your employers might not realize it, but what they've employed is way above anything you've been trained in. And I had a friend, David, who was working in this office space, and it was a toxic environment. So much backstabbing and uh, you know, people lying and cheating and being really unkind to each other. And he hated it. And he began to pray, Lord, help me get a new job. I want to get out of this. And he felt God say, no, what are you going to do about the culture in your place of work? And so he thought, do you know what I can do? I, 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 I like buying chocolate for people. <laughs> so he began buying chocolate bars, Cadbury's, of course, if you really want to bless people. And, and, and so he would go in early before anyone got into the offices and, and he'd leave these like chocolate bars and he'd write a little note saying, you're looking beautiful today. Uh, I love what you do. You're an amazing person. You know, all these kind, kind of mischievous letters and notes. And he said he'd watch people come into the office and they'd find, you know, chocolate bars in their drawers, behind their staplers, you know, by their computers. And People got so excited. Who is this mystery chocolate giver? And people, rather than gossiping about each other in a negative way, they were gossiping about who is this person. And it slowly began to change something of the culture in that place of work because my friend David took responsibility. Rather than just saying, this place is toxic and horrible, he thought, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to live in the opposite spirit. I'm going to speak life. I'm going to encourage. I'm going to bless. I'm going to be generous. I'm going to lift people up. We can all do that. You know, imagine if each and every one of us wrote an email to our line manager that they receive first thing whenever they go back into work. I love working with you. You're amazing. I love this about you. And your line manager wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> if not you, then who? I, I think of a friend of mine, part of our church at Gastry. She was in London, in Regent's Park, walking along, minding her own business. And she saw this couple sitting on a bench. And as she walked past, she thought God said this, that the couple had were struggling to conceive, but the Lord wanted to bless them with a baby. Now, <laughs> she'd been to enough prophetic training classes to know the one thing you never ever prophesy about is babies. And so she's like, whew, <laughs> get out of jail card. I don't have to share this. But as she's walking further and further away, she felt God say, Claire, I want to bless this couple with a child. 
And I want them to know that it's a gift from me. And I'm asking you to be my messenger. So totally terrified. She walks up to this couple. And she says, look, I hope you don't mind. Excuse me, I'm, I'm a Christian. I believe in a God who speaks. And as I was walking past you, I just wondered whether God might be saying that you were struggling to conceive. And this couple, eyes wide. They said, we've literally just come from the hospital where our final attempt at IVF has failed. And the doctors have said, there's no more hope. We'll never be able to have children. We're utterly devastated. My friend Claire, again, nervously, tentatively said, look, I felt God say that he wanted to bless you with a child. Would you be happy for me to pray with you? And this couple said, well, we don't believe in God. We don't really believe in prayer, but if you want to. So she put her hand on their shoulders and she prayed a very quick prayer. And then she said, look, if it's okay, can I give you my phone number? And if anything ever happens, could you just text me? Five months later, she gets this text. It's going to come up on the screen. Hi, Claire. I just wanted to let you know that we are five months pregnant with a little girl. Thank you for your kind words and prayers that day in Regent's Park. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Now, I don't know whether that couple have come to faith in Jesus Christ, but what I'm sure of is when they look at their beautiful miracle child in their arms, that they know God was somehow involved with this miracle. And Claire did everything that God asked her to make sure that couple knew that God loved them and wanted to bless them with a child. She could have easily backed off and said, no way, it's too risky. But she was willing to take responsibility to step out. You know, what God is doing in this community at this time is extraordinary. For many of you, when you're so close to it, you perhaps don't quite see how extraordinary it is. And that's the joy of being able to come in as a guest and see the unbelievable favor that is upon you as a church. And the unbelievable life that this church is bringing to not only Malaysia, but all across Asia. But as I was praying for you, The sense I have is that God is wanting to increase boldness amongst you. And that there are new people that you are going to reach, but it's going to take new boldness to reach those people. A new boldness is going to reach a new people group. And that isn't about one or two brave, courageous evangelists, you know, the super holy ones. No, it's each and every one of us. And this is the other thing I believe you're going to see. God is going to begin to use the most unlikely in the most extraordinary ways. And you might be sitting here thinking, I don't even fully know if I believe in God. And I, I, I don't feel I understand the Bible. I, I'm rubbish at prayer. I, you know, I've got all these questions going on in my mind and in my heart, full of doubt. I'm not gifted enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not good looking enough. Whatever it is, you are exactly the kind of person God is going to use. And so please, 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 don't hide back in the shadows thinking God can't use me. No, <laughs> he specializes in using people like you. And just think what God could do as he begins to use each and every one of you amongst your families and your friends, your places of work, where you hang out, social clubs, uh, sports teams, as God begins to use you, but it's going to require new boldness. And here again is the great news. The Spirit of God is poured out upon us and he gives us fresh courage to do everything he's calling us to do. So I want to ask us to stand, and uh, in the few moments we've got left, I want us to pray that God, by His Spirit, would be poured out upon us, that we'd all take responsibility, because if not you, then who? And God is saying, I want to use you.